Hey guys, welcome to what will be the first of many, many lectures um, for APUS history. So we are going to start with unit one, which is time periods one and two. So this lecture today is just about time period one. Time period one is from 1491 to 1607. So let's break that down for a minute. 1491, we all know the rhyme, in 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean blue. So the reason that we're not starting in 1492 is because we don't even want to take a look at Columbus yet. We want to see what was here before Columbus, so 1491. And this time period, again, goes from 1491 all the way to 1607, and 1607 is the start of the Jamestown colony. Now, for our unit, we'll be doing period one and two. So it actually goes from 1491 all the way to 1754, and that's the French and Indian War. So we're looking at Native Americans, European exploration, British and Spanish and French, all the way up until the British kind of dominate. and um, the beginnings of dissent and, a, and an attempt to break away from Great Britain starting in 1754, French and Indian War issues, okay? So let's get started today. This lecture is entitled Contact because of the contact of Europeans with natives in the New World. So um, how did these natives get to what we call America, um, the New World, even though it's not new, it's very, very old, as old as Europe, but we call it the New World because Europeans were like, wow, we're cool, we're white, we discovered it, it's new. Um, so how did those natives get there? The Bering Strait um, is this idea that during the Ice Ages, I'll show you a picture here, um, the Arctic Ocean and the Bering Sea froze over, and this was land that was able to be walked over from this Siberia area into what we now known at, know as Alaska, and then natives could then go down through the continent um, into what is now America and South America. During this time period, um, more than 40,000 years ago, natives came to America via the Bering Strait, um, and it eventually, those natives will make it all the way down to the tip of South America. The first immigrants here hunted animals. They were hunter-gatherers completely. Um, some even think like woolly mammoths, think Ice Age sort of time period, um, Native Americans. They hunt those animals for meat and fur, and probably fished as well in small fishing vessels made out of trees. As far as um, what food they ate that wasn't meat, um, some civilizations did begin to cultivate crops, and those would be maize, which is corn, uh, amaranth, um, manioc, I'm not saying that right, it's like our uh, tapioca, chili peppers, pumpkins, sweet potatoes, beans, all those things on there, um, things that grow easily in the wild and were able to be gathered and then could be easily planted elsewhere for those early civilizations that began to cultivate crops. Some civilizations, um, I mean, by 8,000 BC, they had already reached the tip of South America, and it's not just like one homogenous group. It is massive amounts of different tribes, different cultures, different languages, different religions of these Native Americans. So just don't think Pocahontas when you think Native Americans. Think an extremely diverse, um, different, differentiated cultures in little spots. You could have one tribe here and seven miles away, another tribe, and they're completely different, different language, have no contact between them. And also don't think of them as uncivilized. Um, many of their civilizations were extremely developed. Cities, governments, religion, churches, rituals, trade, mathematics, astronomy, all of those things need to be attributed to Native Americans, and that is what they truly deserve. A lot of our European science was very much behind Native American science during this time period. Um, probably the most um, well-known because they are large tribes were the Incas in Peru, the Aztecs in Mexico, and the Mayans in the Yucatan Peninsula. And the Mayans were actually wiped out before the Incas and the Aztecs came about. Um, the, those are the South American tribes in North America where um, our American ancestors essentially settled. There were less developed, and I'm not saying backwards or uncivilized, just not as large um, not as large of civilizations, not as much technology, but still very distinct cultures in smaller areas, in smaller groups. Take the Iroquois Confederacy, um, for example, in later years, they are um, an Iroquois tribe spread all over the Northeast, 
that didn't have a giant city like Tenochtitlan, if you were in World City, you know what that is, um, that the Mayans and the Aztecs and the Incas have, but they were still very developed, just in a different way. One thing that's very different about African American tribes that isn't taught to you when you're little, when you're little, is that most just say African American, Native American tribes are matrilineal and matrilocal. Write down those words, matrilineal, matrilocal. And here's what that means. Matrilineal means that um, the, the line of the family goes through the woman. The woman is the head of the household. The name of the family is carried through the mother, through the grandmother, through the daughters. Matrilocal means that women own the property. Um, Men taught their children by persuasion and example, but women were the ones that taught the children um, things in the home as well as things outside the home, how to hunt. Uh, they were in charge of education. They were often in charge of the government structures as well. This isn't true of all Native American tribes, but it is true of a lot. Um, most people lived in small, scattered, nomadic settlements. Um, it's not all the giant cities of the Incan and the Mayan empires. Men were hunters, women were gatherers. Um, women did most of the farming. Um, much of it is slash and burn uh, agriculture where you grow, you harvest, you burn. You start again, grow, harvest, burn. Women, I'm sorry, Europeans step into this, and we're gonna talk about this later, and they see things a lot differently. They see women in charge, and that is so different than European culture that they don't like that. They're almost scared by the women. It's not liked by the Europeans that the society is matrilineal and matrilocal. Um, also, one thing that Europeans don't understand and don't like is that there's no individual land ownership. It's communal ownership of the land and communal success or communal failure, whereas in the European capitalistic world, it is my land, I do with it what I want, I will be successful, or I won't be. If I bust, it's my fault. In Native American culture, almost true of all tribes, that's not the case. It is communal ownership, communal success. Um, clans, families, tribes, they guarded their, their rights to use the land, but it wasn't rights to own the land. So that's the difference between European and Native American ownership of land. Um, and trade was also extremely important to Native Americans. Um, the most important man in the tribe in many cultures was the man who gave the most away, who was able to trade the most, who was the most generous and giving. Um, and it wasn't, trade wasn't like, here, I give you something and you give me something back in many Native American cultures. It was more, I give you something because I want us all to be successful, not expecting anything in return, something that Europeans don't have a concept of. Their trade is, I give you something, you give me something of equal or more value. That is a trade in their sense, but not to Native Americans. Um, but one thing about Native Americans that is not like Europeans is when trade stopped, when um, tribes stopped getting along, stopped trading, that was equal to them not getting along. If we're not trading, we're not getting along is their sense. So if we don't trade, that's tantamount to war. If you say, no, we're not gonna give you something, that's you are declaring war on us. That it was a Native American idea. Whereas Europeans are just like, oh, well, whatever, we'll go trade with someone else, we don't need you. So that idea was different as well between the two. So let's talk, um, we will go more into depth about different tribes at the end of the year, right before you take the AP test because you're gonna forget all this later. So I just gave you the gist right now. We will go back and do more specific things in a minute. Let's talk about, in general, um, religious differences between Europeans and Native Americans. This is the next part on your note set. So listen carefully to me, because I'm gonna tell you different things that you need to write under these three headings. Let's talk about the Christian view of the Bible here. So we know that most Europeans coming here will be Catholic or Protestant. Um, which are both Christian religions. Um, the Christian view of the Bible is that God gave Adam, the first man, dominion over animals and plants. And um, that that is an idea that's different between Native American culture and European culture is Native American culture feel as if they're equal with the land, equal with the spirit of the land and with the animals, and that they have to give back whatever they take. Whereas Europeans just 
kill and plunder and take. <laughs> I, I know that sounds very bad, but it's also very historically accurate. Um, also, the Bible doesn't mention Native Americans, so it kind of makes some Christians weary of them. What are they? Where did they come from? This is not in the book that I've been told that is absolute truth. Um, one difference between the Christian religion with the Bible and Native American culture is Early in the Bible, you see things like human sacrifice, but then um, at the switching of the New Testament with the coming of Christ, you don't see those things anymore. And so many Christians believe that that idea of human and animal sacrifice is no longer needed. We don't need that sacrament. Whereas Native Americans still continue sacrifice, sacrificial temples, skull racks, some cannibalism, snake motifs, um, things like that sort of scare Europeans um, and make them think that the Native Americans are worshiping Satan, in a sense. Many believed that the human sacrifice of the Aztecs was tantamount, many Europeans believed that the human sacrifice of the Aztecs was tantamount to them worshiping Satan. So there's an idea. <laughs> um, but let's kind of like take a look at that human sacrifice versus European violence. Yes, many people, many early Europeans in the New World thought human sacrifice is like worshiping Satan. But when Native Americans find out European history and witness European history in the New World, they see the witches killed in Europe in witch hunts um, and even later on in the Salem witch trials as human sacrifice. How is that different? They learn of the Spanish Inquisition, where um, the fight between Protestantism and Catholicism, where people are killed and people are burned to death at the stake. They see that as human sacrifice. And so Indians, I'm sorry, Native Americans are thinking, your violence is nothing like our human sacrifice. We do it for our religion. You just kill people. So there's a difference between them. We also have a Native American view um, of like the what they see is different when you look back at like the Catholic religion. So Eucharist, and sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself. In the Catholic religion, Eucharist is um, when the body and the blood of Christ become the wine and the bread that you eat. And so Indians learn about this, those that are converted, and they're thinking, you're eating your own God, but you're also, like, enraged at our human sacrifice. Like, that doesn't make sense. That's very confusing to them. Um, but let's talk about the concept of heaven here. Indian Native Americans had no concept of um, heaven in the Christian sense. Instead, they disliked the Christian heaven because essentially the Christian religion says that no Indians are there. No Native Americans are there because they don't believe in God and they don't believe in Jesus Christ. They don't believe in the saving of sins and all those things that get you into heaven in the Christian ideal. They don't believe in that. And so the Native Americans don't like to think there's no Native Americans there, so why would I want to go there? Their idea is more, if we are buried with our ancestors, we will be with them in the afterlife, which is completely different from the concept of Christian heaven. All right, one last difference between Europeans and Native Americans that's not on your sheet, but I still want you to write it down, is um, the difference in how they wage war. So think of like European style war as in straight lines and charge, forward march, that sort of thing. Whereas Native Americans are not like that at all. They're curious as to why Europeans seek such de decisive victories on a battlefield. Um, whereas if Native Americans were waging war, it would be more guerrilla warfare, get in, search and destroy, get out. Um, they see the idea of straight lines of soldiers charging forward as a waste of bodies, essentially. Why would you kill so many humans when it's unnecessary, when those humans could be used to further your race or for human sacrifice or those sort of things? Also, they see Europeans as weak because they make, like, super awful torture victims. Like, they just don't stand up well to harsh conditions of torture and questioning, um, which does happen in, like, the early, think, like, frontier Native Americans capturing the white settlers. One thing that Native Americans are um, extremely confused and hurt by is that Europeans can't easily catch the Native American warriors and thus resort to often killing the women and children um, that are sitting ducks, essentially in the tribe's area of residence. And that's something that Native Americans just couldn't wrap their minds around. Like, why would you kill the innocent women and children just because you can't catch us? But to the Europeans, it was, this is our warfare against you. We don't mind killing innocents. 
Um, Native Americans, one of their strategies when they were warring other Native American nations was capturing the other nation's children and assimilating them into their own culture. So that's just a fun fact for you. All right, so let's start with European exploration. There are some non-Europeans who come prior to Columbus, um, but don't really stay. So some of those early explorers are um, the Afro-Phoenicians, like kind of like an African um, tribe area in like, think like 300, like right around the switch from BC to AD. Um, they may have reached Central America. It's unsure. Um, the research is there, but not absolutely proven because of the lack of written language, um, as well as um, the West African Mali tribes. They um, supposedly sailed to Haiti in like 1311 time period. So from 1311 to like 1450 area, they sailed to Panama, maybe Brazil, Haiti, Central America area there. Um, and those are some things that you just don't learn about when you're a kid, you just learn about Columbus. Another one that you kind of sometimes learn about is the Vikings, um, mainly Leif Erikson. There he is right there in the picture, um, reaching the coast of Canada. And um, he actually founded the temporary, temporary, they didn't say, settlement of Newfoundland in a um, 1000 AD. Thank you. I have a cute Newfoundland dog because of you, Leif Erikson. Okay, moving on. Um, but let's move on to what we all want to learn about. Why did the Europeans come? And let's learn about the real story of Columbus. So let's talk about their motives here. Um, essentially, these nation states are still babies in Europe, and they want to prove that they're the best one. So they're they're seeking power, and they're seeking to outcompete their rivals, especially the Spanish and the British. They will just fight all the time, the whole time that they're in the New World and not in the New World. They just want to beat each other out. Um, also, part of exploration is new military technology. Um, in like the fifth, like 1500 on, we're gonna have new military tactics, meaning that we can beat people up better. And thus, if we explore and take land, we can defend it better, essentially. Um, money, you heard the term um, gold, God, and glory. Money is a major motivation. Um, we need new markets in the East. Think like Columbus is trying to get to India for the spices, for the sugar, for the silk. Um, in that has been traded from China and future world, you know what I'm talking about. Um, but those new markets, we get them, we bring them to Europe, we sell them. We also need the raw materials that other countries have. If we, this little, like, think like the British Isles, we only have so much land. We need to go take other land and make those raw materials so that we can manufacture them into goods that can be sold to our people or other people. Um, we also have religious dissenters um, and religious differences that cause people to migrate to the new world to escape persecution or to exercise religious freedom. Um, one thing that allows people um, from Europe is new exploration technology. We'll have um, the astrolabe that will allow for measuring of the stars in order to know where you're going. We're going to have new cannons, new military technology that makes you really, really cool, um, as well as new astronomical ways to track where you are um, using the stars. Um, compasses, things like that will help as well. Speaking of exploration technology, whew, got ahead of myself. Um, the Portuguese and the Spanish, they were really, really good at studying winds and currents and tides over most of the globe. You can find really old maps of their, their tide projections, and that is how they would sail with the prevailing winds and the strongest tide to where they wanted to go. So very um, advanced science. I'm, I know when you think of Columbus, you don't think of advanced science. You think of like sickness and death and killing Indians and things like that. But um, actually, they were uh, amazing scientists and amazingly good at tracking weather patterns and um, the stars to know where they were. Um, the astrolabe, which is right there, um, oh, I'm sorry, I'm pointing, you don't know what I'm pointing at. The little human with the circle thing is a way to track your position based on where the horizon is and based on a star that you choose. Think like the North Star. We also have the um, perpetuation of the compass, which is going to tell you whether you're north, south, east, or west using the magnetic fields of the Earth. 
Um, and a lot of these ideas come from the Renaissance, the rebirth of culture in Europe. And it's not just the rebirth of culture, it's the rebirth of learning. And that learning leads to more science and technology. So one big player during this time period um, that really we learn about them during this time period and then never again, sorry Portugal, is Portugal. Um, Portuguese exploration, this is their time to shine. This is Portuguese golden age. Um, and they will be the leaders in technology and exploration in the new world for quite some time until the Spanish come in and kick their butt. So um, it's mostly encouraged by their monarch, Prince Henry the Navigator, called such because he um, encouraged exploration. Initially, he seeks um, coastal points below the Sahara Desert. He wants trade with Africa, where Portugal could get around Africa and get to those Arab traders, like get down around Africa to the other side, to the Middle East, to India, to trade with those people. Um, Essentially, he his encouragement will find the water route to Asia in the late 14th century um, from Europe to Asia instead of going through land, which would take a long time. Um, we also have Bartholomew, Bartholomew Diaz, um, who will be the first to sail to the tip of Africa, the Cape of Good Hope, or whatever you want to call it. Vasco da Gama, um, in 1498, reaches India, and he brought back some of those Indian treasures, spices and silks and things like that. Um, and this creates the thirst for European, I'm sorry, for Indian or Arab goods in Europe. People get a taste of that and they want it. And thus we need to find better routes to those areas. Um, it opened the door for Portugal to have trade in the East and they will dominate trade in um, the East. And when I say the East from Portugal, East would be like India, the Arab world, okay? And last one that we're gonna learn about, um, Amerigo Vespucci, which is fun to say, Vespucci. Um, so he will be an explorer, he will live from 1454 to like fifth, early 1500s, and in 1500 exactly, he, um, it, he goes to Brazil. So they will get to, um, after Columbus and all that, he will be the first to, um, give his expose on what Brazil is like. He was, um, he is the one that actually the Americas are named after America, Amerigo. So even though we don't really learn a lot about him, we have him to thank for our name. Um, Portugal eventually establishes trade stations in India, Africa, China, and the East Indies, as well as um, the New World once that becomes more of a thing. <laughs> also, he's a liar and he was not the first one there. So. He named us after himself, and that wasn't the best. All right, here's the man, the myth, the legend, Columbus. So Columbus will sail for the Spanish, but guess what? He's not Spanish. He's Italian. He will go to the um, leaders of the Spanish Empire. Their names are leaving me right now. Um, but essentially, Spain is eager to compete with Portugal. They want to beat Portugal. Portugal's kicking their butt right now. And, oh, there they are. Queen Isabella and King Ferdinand are all for this exploration, but don't really know how to go about it. Columbus goes to them and says, yeah, I can do this. Just give me the moolah. Um, his motives <laughs> are kind of funny. One thing I want to tell you is um, one of his motives is religion. He was a very religious man, and he had the staunt belief that um, the world was going to end in 1648 and that God would make the gospel available to all mankind in the last days. And so his idea was, I need to spread the gospel, and I will bring in a new millennium, the 1500s. Everyone will become a Christian, and then the world will end. Yes, that is what he believed. I'm not kidding you. Um, so all that's kind of on the surface. He says, I want to spread religion. I want to help the Spanish. But underneath, it's like, I want to make money. King Ferdinand and Queen Isabella are paying me a lot to do this. Um, his belief is that he um, will find a way to sail west and make it to India. That's what he wanted, those Indian spices and Indian goods. He actually lands in the Bahamas on October 12, 1492. In 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean blue. Um, and he believed that he had reached the East Indies, so the east coast of India on the Indian Ocean, those like baby islands. He believed that he'd made it there. Uh, actually, he made it to the island of Hispaniola, 
where um, the Arawaks were a friendly Native American tribe. He called them Indians. That is supposedly where we get the name Indians for Native Americans. Um, and they were friendly. They had tobacco. They had some gold. And eventually Columbus is not so friendly back and will exterminate the Arawak tribe. And all his followers will populate the island of Hispaniola, and this is where we get a lot of the issues of European exploration. Kind of starts with Columbus. So let me ask you this. Um, oh, one last thing. Until his death in 1506, Columbus maintained that he had found India. He said, no, I found the Indies. Um, in fact, he was very, very wrong. So let me ask you this. How should Columbus's discovery be viewed, triumphant or genocidal? And I'm going to leave that one up to you. Was it important that he found the new world, he so called it? Was it triumphant in a way for him and for the Europeans? Is it historically significant? Or should it be seen as an act of genocide completely wiping out the Arawak tribe? So that's a little tidbit for you to think about. Um, other Spanish exploration tidbits that you need to write down here, the Treaty of Tordesillas um, is where Spain basically says, look, our dude Columbus landed here, and so it's ours. So this is in 1494, and eventually Portugal and Spain are fighting over the areas that they claimed that they had claim to lay claim to in the New World. And it will take um, the New World and split it kind of like down the middle with a big old line. And um, Portugal will get Brazil. That's why they still speak Portuguese there. And some territory in Africa and Asia. And Spain will essentially get North and South America, with the exception of Brazil. And so it's essentially the Europeans coming in to this land where there are Native Americans already and saying, this is our land. We made a treaty. It's called the Treaty of Tordesillas. So this is what Portugal gets. This is what Spain gets. Live with it. One famous um, idea of Spanish exploration is what we know as conquistadors. And conquistadors um, are conquerors. That's what that means in Spanish. Um, one of the most famous of those is um, Hernando de Soto and Hernando Cortez, and they will do work. Uh, Cortez will conquer the Aztecs, like literally conquer the Aztecs, and for quite a while, um, the Aztec leader, Montezuma, I know I'm saying that wrong, uh, thought that Cortez was a god that had come, like this white man just suddenly showed up, and he's a god, we should worship him. And Cortez uses that against them, essentially, and will conquer them within four years, 1518 to 1521, and he has completely conquered a native race. Um, the conquistadors, their idea is God, gold, glory, essentially. Go for Spain, conquer it for money, and maybe spread some religion a little bit. They will mostly enslave um, natives for labor purposes, and think like the the mountains in Chile or um, in Central South America. There's lots of silver mines there, and it was nasty, awful work that the um, the natives were enslaved to do, mining gold and silver. We also have um, Pizarro. What's his first name? Francisco Pizarro defeated the Incas in 1513, and from the Incas, he stole massive amounts of silver and gold. The impact of all of this, the long-term impact of Spanish conquest, is that it will create a race. One impact is that it will create a race of people that had never before existed, mestizos. And mestizos is um, those that are born of Indian and Spanish descent. Um, and they kind of end up in a weird place where socially they don't know where they are. The Spanish are up here. The natives were seen as down here. And mestizos are like kind of, they can float in the middle where they're not seen as the lowly natives. They won't be enslaved, but they're not seen as true European Spanish. The Spanish will also have an empire from coast to coast. And I'm not just saying our coast to coast. I'm saying like Spain all the way down into Africa, into India. Um, and the West Indies, East Indies, all the way across the Atlantic Ocean into South and North America. Spain will own so much of the world for quite some time. And that is why Spanish is such an influential language in South America and even in parts of North America creeping up into the United States. It, 1492 on, Spanish is the language that people spoke um, 
because of Spanish exploration. Now, that will change once the, once the British take over, but think like 1450s world, 1500s world, the Spanish language is the most influential. And that is still around today. We still learn Spanish in school today. And if the French had conquered all of where we live right now, then maybe we'd be speaking French in schools. But um, the lasting impact, I think the most lasting impact is the Spanish language. All right, so there's the line of the Treaty of Tordesillas. Sorry, I didn't show it to you earlier. Um, on the left, you see what is to be controlled by Spain. On the right, you see what is to be controlled by Portugal, technically, although um, eventually Spain will go through and take a lot of those areas as well. So let's move on to something a little bit less depressing, French exploration. No? Nope. We're going on with Spanish. Here we go. <laughs> so uh, one of, another impact of Spanish exploration is the establishment of St. Augustine. So um, the Spanish Empire will stretch from California to Florida into the tip of South America for quite some time, but their oldest establishment in 1565 um, is St. Augustine. And the purpose of St. Augustine was to keep the French out of those Spanish conquest territories and protect uh, the seas of the Caribbean. So this is on the coast of Florida now, and you can actually go there and visit some of their old structures, which is really cool. So think that there's something in America from 1595. Um, we also have Santa Fe. Santa Fe is an important um, province in New Mexico, what is now New Mexico, and what was then known as New Mexico Territory in 1609. Um, Santa Fe kind of becomes the capital of the Spanish province in North America. There's a large missionary presence there, um, a lot of Dominican friars, a lot of um, just Spanish Catholic missionaries there attempting to convert natives to Catholicism. And lastly, I have Ponce de Leon on here. Um, and this is just really interesting to me, Florida history, that uh, Ponce de Leon was <laughs> looking for the fountain of youth in Florida. And um, essentially discovered a lot of Spanish land there while looking for that. All right, one important thing, oh my gosh, like the most important thing from this lecture, if you hear anything, please listen to this, the Columbian Exchange. Um, I'll just write down some of these major points for me here. Um, the Columbian Exchange is named after Columbus because we attribute him to first contact between natives and Europe, even though that's completely historically inaccurate. Um, the Columbian Exchange is how we exchange our cultures, but mostly our food and our stuff. So uh, some of the main things that come from Europe to the America is cattle, horses, and diseases. Oh my goodness, Europeans are so immune to some diseases that natives weren't immune to because they weren't a lot around that many people and didn't have exposure to diseases, that smallpox and other diseases will absolutely wreck the entirety of um, Native American cultures and eradicate lots of them. So disease is the major, disease in horses are the major givers of Europeans to Native Americans. What Native Americans will give to Europeans is corn, potatoes, tobacco, um, and one disease that Europeans hadn't had before, syphilis. Um, and yes, it's the syphilis you're thinking about. Um, Africans contribute in this big ordeal as well because Europeans are trading with Africans and taking that stuff over to the New World. A disease such as malaria and yellow fever, but also important things like sugar and rice. And sugar plantations will be huge in the Bahamas. Um, we will also have the perpetuation of tea because Great Britain will take tea and spread it everywhere. But tea originally comes from the East Indies, um, the area on the right there. Here's another um, idea of the Columbian Exchange, this one is less specific on where things come from and essentially shows stuff from Old World to New World, Old World being Europe, New World being the new place to be exploring North and South America. So from the New World to the Old World, we'll get the big players, tobacco, turkey, um, cocoa, peppers, potatoes, tomatoes, and from the Old World to the New World, tons of diseases, um, domesticated livestock like cattle, sheep, and horses sugar, coffee, and citrus fruits. Some things that we think about being grown in South America, citrus fruits and coffee weren't there originally. So let's talk about, well, what if this had never happened? I just want to open your mind here a little bit. What do Native Americans ride in movies? Horses, 
without the Columbian Exchange, they would not be riding horses. Um, and those are like, I think like 1800s Native Americans. What type of food uses tomatoes often? Italian food. They wouldn't have tomatoes if it weren't for the contact between the New World and the Old World. What would the New World look like without disease? What if those Europeans had never come over and never spread smallpox, malaria, yellow fever? The New World would be have so many Native Americans. We would be descended from Native Americans and Native Americans only. Um, but instead, lots of those populations were eradicated. Uh, what food is Ireland most famous for? Potatoes. Great potato famine. Kills a lot of them. They all moved to America. That would have never happened without the Columbian Exchange because we get the potatoes from the New World. Uh, where do our oranges and peaches come from? Think like Florida and Georgia. Mm -mm. Citrus fruits come from the Old World, actually. And what, just fun question. With that tobacco before the discovery of the New World, I'm just wondering what did Europeans smoke? Hmm. All right, on to French exploration here. Um, the French kind of come in late in the game and thus will meet problems with um, Great Britain and with the Spanish and the Portuguese having taken a lot of those things. What they have not gotten to is Canada, and that's where mostly the French will be. Um, Samuel de Champlain, Cham Champlain um, is called the father of New France, and he will find Quebec in 1608. Again, they're late to the game here. We're talking like the, one of the first settlements of um, Span the Spanish was in the early 1500s, and here are the French in 1608. The One of the things that the French are most successful in is, is creating an effective trade relationship with the natives. So a lot of other settlements that aren't French will struggle because they just want, want no contact or violent contact with the natives, whereas the French are more apt to be friends with the natives and trade with them and see that as their route of success in the New World because then there's less of a threat of the natives. Um, British settlers, they just want to remove or exterminate the natives, and Spanish settlers kind of seek to Christianize them and or use them as slaves. Um, the French, they start this tradition of trade because they become kind of like great gift givers. And they, that's the key to getting the Indians, I'm sorry, the natives on their side because the those intertribal relationships, remember I told you earlier, were based on trade. Um, a lot of that is, um, where am I here? Beaver trade. Beaver hides and beaver skins, very common in um, like North United States, Canada area there. And um, we also have a lot of voyaging from the Frenchmen um, and they will recruit Native Americans to help them navigate through the waters of this North American area in order to trade. Um, Robert de la Salle um, sailed from Quebec down through the Great Lakes down to the Mississippi River with the help of Native Americans. And um, this is why Louisiana is still kind of a French area today. Lots of them speak French um, with a French heritage and French food because of Robert de la Salle who had um, taken over the Great Lakes area and even sailed down to the Mississippi and took over Louisiana, which is kind of rough because Florida, where the Spanish are, and Louisiana are right there. But New Orleans will be held by the French for quite some time, one of the most important points in the New World because it can establish contact because contact, it's on the coast with Central America and South America, and all the trade was happening in New Orleans for quite some time. Um, here's just a little picture of Native Americans beaver skins with the French here. All right, let's discuss the English. Bum, bum, bum. And the English is where uh, lots of Americans look to as their heritage because we broke away from them. So this is how they get their start in the New World. Essentially, um, the major causes leading to this British colonial impulse is that they're not fighting with Spain right now. And typically, always, they were fighting with Spain. When that took a little break, they have an opportunity to expand without harassment. Um, one thing that is an issue in the British Isles is land and jobs, because there's very limited land, and you can't just strike it out as a farmer if you don't have land. Um, and so lots of people... Um, if you're running out of farmland, then you're probably running out of jobs, and lots of people will um, migrate to the New World because of economic issues. The population growth um, in Europe at the time and in Great Britain at the time is great for providing 
colonists, but not great if you don't have land. So why do we go find other land? Because we have lots of people and we need room to expand and we need jobs for them. We need farmland for them. And um, probably one of the most um, well-known reasons why many Europeans, sorry, um, why many British people come to the New World is for religious or political freedom. Um, religious dissenters, the Puritans, the Pilgrims, things like that. One important term I need you to write down and know what it is, is joint stock company. A joint stock company provides a financial means for exploration and eventually, essentially it means that investors, people put their money together into a pot and say, this is our money to use in this new world, we're going to establish a colony. And everyone is an investor, so everyone wants to do well. That is a joint stock company and they will start many of the colonies in the new world. Um, they will be met with lots of competition. The British will be met with lots of competition from the Spanish and later on the French. Um, one man who will meet competition mostly with the French is John Cabot. Um, in 1497, he's going to explore the coast of Newfoundland and all the way to Virginia and claim it all for the English crown. And this is where Great Britain kind of gets their um, foot in the door in the New World, and it is in Virginia. And Virginia will be so important to um, the British during their exploration and colonization time. Sir Francis Drake was known as a sea dog. He is a pirate, um, but he was a, like, hired by the great British Queen Elizabeth the Crown pirate. And essentially he will track down Spanish ships, burn them down, pillage them, and take all the stuff for Queen Elizabeth. Totally illegal, but because the Queen says it goes, it goes. Um, Sir Humphrey Gilbert will attempt to colonize um, Canada before the French get there but doesn't work well because it's cold and they don't do well in the cold, and the French will get there later. Um, Sir Walter Raleigh is um, the man who founded Roanoke. We all know how that goes. So Roanoke is a colony of 115 men, women, and children. They um, show up. They will establish a colony. For three years, it, it goes on for a while. Sir Walter Raleigh leaves, comes back. No one is there. So this island was completely wiped away, mysteriously vanished in Virginia, um, and on a tree carved into the tree is the word Croatoan, and people still don't know what that means. Um, it could be a Native American tribe wiped them out. It could be they all ran away. It could be they, they all died, but it's just like a ghost town that was left. And Sir Walter Raleigh is like, where's my settlement? It was here a few years ago when I left. And that is the lost colony of Roanoke, one of the most fascinating colonization stories. Um, one thing that's really important to British exploration has absolutely nothing to do with exploration. In 1588, the British defeat the Spanish Armada. This is Queen Elizabeth versus King Philip II of Spain. Um, Spain attempted to invade England um, with their giant, awesome navy called the Armada, 130 ships. Um, essentially, they're met with storms, and they're met with Great Britain, who's ready for them, and they are beat into the ground, beat to a pulp. And this helped England in a sense of asserting naval dominance. And with the beating of the Spanish Armada, people are like, yeah, Great Britain, women, woo, 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 nationalism. And thus, the British Navy, since the Armada is done so, can rule the Atlantic and exploration can continue without harassment there. Uh, here's a picture of Roanoke and the, the name carved into the tree, Croton. All right, so let's talk about just in general results from this colonization here. For natives, their history here is marred by genocide. By 1600, nearly 90% of Native American population had perished from European diseases, smallpox, yellow fever, malaria, as well as alcoholism, because they didn't have alcohol before, now they do. And their culture is absolutely destroyed, as well as through wars, contact, um, disagreements with the with the Europeans who would just slaughter them. So that is what it was like for Native Americans living during this time period. For Europeans, their impact was they spread their culture throughout. They spread the domestication of animals. They spread the perpetuation of firearms. Um, they spread their language. They spread their religion. Um, and essentially, for them, they get the, the good part of this deal. Global empires, 
um, more markets to sell their stuff, the perpetuation of capitalism, and you make it or break it, you can make a lot of money. And also they get a lot of yummy food from the new world. Thank you for potatoes and tomatoes. Yum. Um, England will get these kind of like ideas, these stereotypes. English settlements will be seen as more democratic, hardworking, and will speak English. French settlements, um, they will spread their language and religion um, in mostly Canada, and they will be friends with the natives. And then the Spanish, they're good at setting up schools, hospitals, um, and printing presses, and they're often known for their really, really good side, their missionaries, or their bad side, the conquistadors. So there you go.